Welcome. I'm Martha Seelman. I'm the Executive Director of Studio Art Quilt Associates. And this is the first of a series of textile talks. The textile talks are being put on by a consortium of fiber art organizations. And Sakwa is the first um, to present a textile talk. Next week, the International Quilt Museum um, Curator of Exhibitions, Carolyn Ducey, will be giving a talk on cultivating culture, botany, gardening, and 19th century American quilts. Today, Sakwa um, is very excited to be working with the Regina Quick Center Assistant Director Evelyn Penman to tell you about 3D expression. Before we get started, I just want to, um, to tell you a little bit about Sakwa. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our organization, Studio Art Quilt Associates is a membership organization. We have about 3,700 members around the world in 39 countries. And we provide a forum for people who are passionate about art quilts. We provide a conference, we publish a quarterly journal, we put on educational webinars like this one, and we also have a very active exhibition program. In any given year, we have more than 30 exhibitions happening, um, some of them at the regional level, some of them at the local level, and then somewhere between 12 and 16 global exhibitions that travel to multiple museums and other venues around the world. 3D Expression is one of those exhibitions, and it <clears throat> premiered last year at the Gerald Ford Museum in Michigan. And uh, right now, um, or starting in February, it's at the Regina Quick Center for the Arts at St. Bonaventure University. However, because of COVID-19, it's in quarantine. And so nobody can get in to see it. Um, so we're having this virtual way to share with you the art from that exhibition and to have you get to meet the four of the artists whose works are there. I'm really excited to be working with Evelyn Penman, who is the Assistant Director of the Quick Center, and she's going to be moderating this panel discussion, introducing you to the four artists, Betty Busby, Shannon Dion, Patty Kennedy Zafrid, and Judy Martin. She'll then be asking them probing questions about their inspiration and their techniques. And then after her, uh, questions, we will be taking questions from the audience. So if you would like to ask any of the artists or ask Evelyn questions, please type them into the chat box. I'll be watching those questions come through and then we'll have a time at the end where I'll ask as many of them as I can possibly get in. And um, I hope that you enjoy this presentation. Evelyn, over to you. Well, thank you, Martha. Uh, the Regina A. Quick Center for the Arts is an arts center and museum on the campus of St. Bonaventure University in Western New York State. And we currently have the Studio Art Quilt Associates exhibition, 3D Expression, on display in our quarantine galleries. In this exhibition, there are over 40 works by textile artists all over the world and we're pleased to be able to speak to four of them today. Since the galleries have been closed, uh, our visitors have not been able to come see the, the works and we're happy to talk with some of the artists uh, and bring it to our visitors today. So thank you all for joining us. Hi everybody, this is Betty. This is the piece that I have in the show. It's called Ginger Jar. I actually began life as a sculptor. I majored in ceramics with an emphasis on sculpture. And I thought I would revisit some of the pottery forms that we learned about in school. And this is named after a traditional Asian pottery shape that is used for food storage. Next, please. This is a little bit about how I make these things. 
Uh, for this pattern, I made a bunch of these. Uh, I love this black, this very loosely woven black mesh. And it makes very interesting patterns when you manipulate the weave. So here I am pushing the weave around and I'm hand basting it to a linen substrate to get it to stay in place when I stitch it. Next, please. And I'm machine stitching it here. And I am couching uh, yarn around each one of the shapes to give me a little bit more color and a little bit more definition and emphasis. And it is a miracle that I didn't sew over my finger doing this. Next, please. So basically, each one of these is a quilt and this is fairly large it's about four by six feet or no four by five feet excuse me and i'm going to wrap this piece around an armature and shape it to the armature next please here i am making the armature i'm using a sono tube as the base and i'm creating a plaster dome to, to make the curve shape on the top. So I am layering uh, material and plaster the same way that you would get your broken arm from riding horses um, made into a cast. So I will take make multiple layers and create this rounded shape and then remove that uh, metal bowl and just have the plaster and the sono tube underneath everything as an armature. Next, please. And I'm stitching the top on here. Um, as you can see, there are no tricks here. I take the quilt that I made and I hand seam it into a circle and I smooth it over the armature and I am shaping it to the armature with traditional hand sewing techniques. I, in my checkered career, I had a, a stint as a tailor. So I learned a lot about um, hand sewing. So I am using gathering stitches to bring in the quilt to uh, go on the curve that is on the top here. Next please. This is a piece that is called tribute because it is, there's a saying that we stand on the shoulders of giants and this is a tribute to those generations of potters that anonymously made these beautiful pieces that we think about even today. And the reason that I put this one in is that you can see the details of the gathering stitches that I'm using towards the bottom of these pieces to bring the quilt in to give it a more interesting shape. So following this are several more pieces that I've made using this technique. Next please. Here's one out of Silk Du Peony, and I use actually kitchen string to create this pattern on the top. Next, please. This one on the left, uh, I've used hair ties, also made out of Silk Du Peony, and the one on the right is used two different fabrics together to create this contrasting pattern. And I thought I would leave you with the next slide, which is, on the left is I'm No Angel, and on the right is vengeance. So thanks for listening and here comes Shannon. Hi, um, my name is Shannon Dion. Um, I'm happy to be here. Go ahead and go on to the next. Thank you. This is my piece in the exhibit, Miriam's Well. Um, the inspiration for this came about from stories of Jewish tradition that said um, Prophet Miriam had such um, faith in God and love for her people that when they wandered in the desert, um, a well of water followed them. And so my what if is what if it was Miriam's pitcher that was the source of that water. Next, please. Um, so I started with the, the vase, the pitcher. Um, the picture on the left shows you that sometimes it's trial and error. I thought I had the right dimensions and they were way too big ended up cutting it down to the one on the right to get the right size. Um, and so it went together. It's fabric and Tim Tex. Next picture, please. And the base, the water is uh, fabric and a denim inside, denim and then fabric fused onto each side of it, quilted. And then I cut wedges into it and sew it together to give it the shapes that I want it to have to look like water flowing. 
next picture, please. Um, so this is this is where it's been cut and sewn together to give the base of the um, the water. It's just pieces, wedges cut and pulled together and zigzagged um, to give it the shape I want. And um, that pool of water on the top was probably the hardest part of the entire thing. Next, please. Um, that's my water. I'm, I'm usually used to working with cottons, but I realized to get that look of flowing water, I needed to add other layers. So I started with a sheer base and just kind of added color and embellishment to it to give the view of uh, running water. Next, please. And then you can tell the wire there, that's the, the where the water got wrapped around. It's actually a garden stake that has a, it's a stick it in the ground with a loop on the top to hold the plant straight. I just ended up finding a way to wedge the loop into the bottom. And it's the one that holds the water in the pitcher up. Next, please. These rocks were originally going to be the weight to hold the water down. Um, I went out and grabbed rocks out of my yard, covered them with uh, batting and fabric and did some embroidery on them. Um, they ended up not being heavy enough, so I had to find something else. So uh, next picture, please. I at least had to give them their own home. So I had to make a bowl for them. So they didn't become the weights, but they were still pretty. So I had to do something for them. Uh, next picture, please. My current passion right now are pomegranates. Um, the three on the left are three dimensional that I actually built the base off a regular pomegranate, draw, drew out the shape of it. And it was a lot of trial and error, but it was a lot of fun. And the little quilt on the right is um, kind of a beginning of a series working with pomegranates in it just to kind of start pushing myself a little bit more. Uh, next, please. And then these are just uh, some of my early playing with three-dimensional art. Um, I had found a wonderful book uh, by Linda Johansson that kind of showed how to get started. And I just kind of took that and went from there. Um, I was also inspired by another book by June Barnes, who kind of, they both inspired me to say, oh, you know, you can go more than two-dimensional in a quilt. And I've just kind of gone forward. Thank you very much. And on to the next person, please. Oh, my studio, yep. <laughs> Hi, I'm Patty Kennedy Zafrat, and I'm delighted to share with you my piece from 3D Expressions, Shift Change. Telling a story and creating a narrative is always at the heart of my work. Part of my series featuring working men and women of the 1940s and 50s, this accordion book is built from silk screened images of Pittsburgh steel workers on hand dyed fabric and quilted. The composition actually was created almost by accident when I discovered that by stitching Peltex with a zigzag, it became flexible in either direction. As I stitched together one page and then another, and then another, I ended up with this fun result. Next. The books can be arranged in nearly any configuration, small, pulled out, circular, and on the front of this one, you can see the attachment of a vintage dues paid button which the steel workers had to wear every day, representing that they had paid their union dues for that month. Every month, there was a different color. I have a collection of those. Next. This is another piece from the Steel Town series, a diptych called Second Shift. I find these images really compelling, representing men from different backgrounds and cultures, all working so hard to provide for their families and their children. The leftover prints from several, several of these quilts provided me with the materials for the accordion book that's in 3D Expressions. The Steel Town series was inspired, of course, by my hometown of Pittsburgh, where the steel industry at one time was a dominant force in our economy. Next. Making the accordion books is really fun and easy to manage compared with creating a six or seven foot quilt. This piece, Veld Windows, based on vintage postcards of geisha from Japan, features not only quilting, but embellishments of painting, image transfer of vintage postage stamps, and some Japanese writing. The book also made use of additional silk screen prints from larger quilts. Instead of using a stitched edge, this book I hand bound with fabric, like binding the edge of a quilt. It was definitely hard on my hands. Next. This is called Coal Town, Second Shift. And again, utilizing the historical images courtesy of the Library of Congress and the National Archives, both of a real treasure trove of beautiful photographs from our nation's past. 
It's embellished with numbered copper hang tags. I don't know if you can see a couple of them, which the miners would take down into the shaft when they checked out their equipment. At the end of the shift, the board where the tags were hung would be checked to make certain all the tags had been returned, which indicated then that all the miners had come safely out of the shaft. Next. Some of the most compelling images I use were taken in the early 1900s and are part of my child labor series. All the photos from that series were taken by Lewis Hine, a retired school teacher, as he traveled across the country documenting children working in factories, farms, and yes, coal mines. This is Glimpse of Daylight, the Boys of the Mines, with boys from West Virginia and Pennsylvania. The older boys were 11 and 12 years old, and you can see that their helmets actually carry a live flame for a light, not a ball. The smaller boys, referred to as breaker boys, would sort the raw materials by hand, and they were as young as five and six years old. And for most of these boys, this was the beginning of their entire life's work. Next. One of the most delightful aspects of making quilts for me is dyeing and printing the fabric. After I choose images for a quilt, I then decide the color palette that I think will best express the story or the mood. I dye fabrics using various shibori and resist techniques, as well as low water immersion dyeing. Most of my fabrics have been dyed at least twice, layering the patterning and the colors. Next. It's always exciting to unroll a piece of fabric to see the results. I wear a mask when I mix the dyes, which helps prevent irritation, especially if I'm dyeing every day for several days in a row. Preparing fabrics for a large quilt of mine can easily take two to three weeks of daily dye sessions. Although today, I might need that mask to go to the grocery. <laughs> Next. After the fabrics are ready, I silk screen the images, which is done in a very traditional way, emulsion coated screen exposed in a dark room. I iron my cut fabrics on the freezer paper, which makes them really easy to handle. Um, I'm really fortunate to be able to rent studio space at Artist Image Resource in Pittsburgh, a print shop available to local artists. Because printing with silk screens takes a lot of space, it can be very messy, so I'm really happy that I don't have to do this at home. In these photos, you can see that I'm printing some of the vintage feed sacks for my American Portrait series about independent family farmers, as well as some hand dyed fabrics. Feed sacks are definitely wild cards to print and really unpredictable. And printing is unpredictable. If you get a bad pole and it's a bad print, that's the end of that piece of fabric and or that feed sack. Next. Finally, I'll close. Um, as you can see, with a background in journalism and photography, I'm really just a storyteller at heart. Creating these sometimes imaginary narratives from a point in history, combining images that I think speak to each other and maybe to you is really at the heart of my work. I end with this one, it's called Heart of the Home. It's a recent quilt featuring the women, young mothers and girls from the Dust Bowl era printed on the vintage feed sacks. This quilt has become one of my favorites. I hope it's one of yours. Thanks so much for your attention. Hello. I'm delighted to be speaking with you today from my home on Manitoulin Island in Huron. Thank you to everyone concerned for inviting me to be part of this presentation. Uh, in this photo, I'm standing in front of a piece of work in progress. This piece is a good example of how my work is grounded in the sense of touch and in the passage of time. I use reclaimed domestic textiles to make artworks that are larger than a human can reach. I spend a long time with each piece as I make the marks with repeated hand stitching. Time and touch are my main materials and my subject is our vast inner world. Next, please. This is my piece that is in the 3D expression exhibition. The title is Not to Know, But to Go On. Words that seem very apt for this uncertain situation that we're now in as a globe. We just have to trust and continue. I started it on my 59th birthday when it occurred to me that I was going to turn 60 in a year. And that was a big deal. So I started to mark every day of my 59th year and continued until I turned 62. So there's three years of time documented in this piece. It whirled past 
It was daily, done daily, and it measures 13 inches by 220 feet. Next, please. Um, to construct it, I worked into pieces of artist canvas that could be in my lap. They measured 13 inches by 22 inches. And then I eventually joined them together to make the long scroll you see here. I marked each day with an entire skein of cotton embroidery floss that I purchased at my local five and dime. There are over a thousand skeins of thread in here because it covers three years. Each year is 365 days. Um, so there's a thousand dollars, I said that. <laughs> in the photo was me, uh, me standing there. You can see with my hand touching, that's the back of the piece and you can tell from that uh, which each day is because it's marked color so on the front which is the fabric side the cloth it's not so easy to tell which day passes by but it is the color of marks each day to choose the color of thread i would close my eyes because we really don't know what each day brings do we and uh but the fabrics are from my life collection uh, my, I am a quilt maker. I had a lot of fabrics, and they're also from family clothing and my own clothing. Um, the com combinations of thread and cloth were unexpected, not planned, but I find that they're all. Next, please, because the next images are of my daily view on Manitoulin Island, where I li live. And you can see by looking at these images how it's reflected in the stitch journal with that horizon line out in front of me that changes color hourly. And the one in the in the center shows with Lemacon Peninsula around um, when the sun is just setting, it hits that peninsula across from us and makes it glow. Uh, the, the photo on the right is my piece, not to know but to go on, laid out on the grass like it is a pathway or a narrow rug. Um, my, my father came from Finland when he was five, and so this piece does reflect my Finnish heritage as well. Next, please. This piece is um, related to Not to Know But to Go On, but it is a, a new piece, newer. Um, it uses the same technique, though. It uh, uses old and saved damask tablecloth scraps that I had and also a variety of blue blue fabrics because I wanted it to resemble a cloud. The title is Cloud of Time and it is not a journal but it is an accumulation of of days. There's 365 days, 365 schemes of thread and my fabric that I uh, stitch all this thread to is artist canvas. Again, I worked in my lap in smaller pieces and then joined them together to make the longer scroll. This one is only 88 feet long. Uh, next, please. Okay, now I'm going to be showing you some that I, I work with um, the female shape. And um, this one is called Red Moon. It's made from a wool blanket that was in my husband's family for a hundred years. Uh, it's very well used. You can see where the hands over time tugged at the edges to pull it up and tuck it in. And so it has been worn. So I did some mending on it and um, used just the top and bottom borders to make this long piece and display it this way because it has this beautiful shape, a 3D shape that came just from the fact that it is cloth and it is soft. Next, please. This one is entitled Moon Cloth. Um, when it's displayed, it spins slightly and you can see both the outside of the vessel, vessel and you can see the inside of the, of the vessel. It's important to me that you can see both sides of of my work because that's one thing I love about cloth art is that there are two sides to a piece of cloth and just like there's two sides to a human person there's the outside we present to the world and there's a, a much more beautiful and, and 
vulnerable inner world. Uh, th this is dyed with indigo, heavily stitched, and it's about 53 inches high and 20 inches across. Next, please. The next one is entitled uh, Red Catalone. There it is. And it's made from journal papers that have been cut into narrow strips and stitched to an old linen cloth. It was inspired by the traditional bed coverings made in French Canada, early French Canada, called catalones. And they were made by weaving narrow strips of used clothing into a thread base. This piece is made from the collected thoughts and dreams that I was having at the time. And so it's a blanket for the inner world. And it's, it's a tablecloth that's been covered with paper and red thread, and it measures 48 inches by 60 inches. Next. Another ancient blanket that has been rescued, mended, dyed, stitched, cut, and then stitched some more. Both sides have been stitched in different ways. I worked, um, I worked to make it stronger and I worked to make it also weaker by cutting into it. Um, I always thought of it as a woman as I was touching it over and over again. And I like to exhibit it so that the inside is visible. Well, I was sad when I began it, but I was changed by making it. And so the title is Flowers Started Blooming Inside Me. It's 67 inches high and 62 inches wide. May I please? So this is my studio that I work in uh, town. I have two studios, one at home and one that I have to drive 20 minutes to in Little Current. I'm showing you this one because this is how you can see how I have to work when I want to work large. I need to have a ladder and I need to have um, a big table. And I, I just wanted to, you to see how both sides of this piece will be shown when it is hanging free, like I'm hoping it will be when it is a sculptural piece. It's inspired by the rock cuts of Northern Ontario. And um, one side, as you can see, is French knots. And the other side is plant dyed fabric that's been torn into strips and affixed to two old blankets sewn side by side and um, with the French knots. It's been, I've been working on it for quite a while. And um, I guess that's it for me. And thank you for having me. My first question is for Betty Busby. Um, Betty, you've uh, clearly embraced working with 3D textiles um, after other careers in, in other mediums of art. How did you get started working with 3D textiles and how has it changed things you've made after that? Well, that's a great question. Uh, when I was fixing the turn uh, 60, I decided that 60 was going to be the new 20, so I'm going backwards now. I'm in my teens. <laughs> but I started with cylinders because when you make pottery, that is the first thing you learn and it's similar to um, practicing scales and music. So I made a bunch of cylinders and I make cylinders to this day because it's very useful and very versatile. Well, great. Okay, thank you. Um, but how has it changed things that you, uh, working in 3D, how has that changed the other work that you do? Do you only work in 3D now? No, because cost benefit ratio, you know, it's very expensive to uh, uh, send these things different places. So I don't actually do as much as I like. Um, and it really, I, I love to work with texture and I have for a long time. So maybe that is what's affected my work now is there's more and more texture because that's something that's really unique to fabric and I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question for Shannon, if she's there. Okay. Um, you started out, I hope we're not confusing people by going from artist to artist, but you talked a little bit about the structural challenges that you had in making Miriam's Well. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about your personal inspiration for that piece? 
Um, it, it was interesting. Part of it um, has come about from the desire to do more three-dimensional stuff. I have started out as a seamstress, went into quilting later, and um, was really fascinated with the idea of three dimension. But um, this particular piece um, came about um, partly because of a Torah study class I was in and um, talking about uh, the prophets is when I realized that there are seven women prophets that we hardly ever hear about. And I thought that maybe they deserved a voice. And also the story, the comment in the Torah just mentions that Miriam died and then there was no more water. Um, and I was really fascinated by the fact that maybe if she was the reason for that, then maybe her water pitcher what, was what brought that source. Her, her pitcher, you know, uh, pottery and the things that people had at the time weren't disposable. You took good care of them. You had them with you all the time. You didn't just get rid of them and go buy a new one or make a new one. And so it would have had, had been something that was always with her. Um, I was also inspired by a show that's been a while ago called Warehouse 13, where the concept behind it is things that live through some amazing traumatic or exciting events with the person, a person are imbued with some kind of power or value from that event. And so it made sense that her picture would have been the source. And when she was gone, it would have lost its power. And so I wanted to kind of honor this prophet and her story. And it, it was three-dimensional from the beginning. I just couldn't, it just didn't seem right to make it flat. I wanted the water to pour. And so that was my challenge to learn how to do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, Patty, can I bring you on? Sure. And ask you, I, I'd like to know how you began using historic photographs in your work. And along with that, can you talk about how you utilize different dyeing techniques for different projects. When I initially began making art quilts, um, I was using my own photographs and self portraits and things like that. And I was, once I, the real game changer is I learned learning to silk screen and to be able to make images that were really large. In fact, even perhaps larger than life. Um, and so I stumbled on the Library of Congress photographic collection and just, just fell in love with all the beautiful images that were there and realized that a lot of them could be converted into a stunning silkscreen. Um, and a lot of them are copyright, most of them are copyright free, which is an important issue that I have to deal with, you know, using imagery on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And if, if the downloadable image isn't large enough for the silk screen size, they will also rescan it for you and send you a CD. So it just suddenly gave me this opportunity. And I just, I love the historic storytelling that it's from the past, but it still refers to the present. I mean, the working man's struggle is still a present issue. The issue of the independent family farmer is still an issue. And, and initially when I first started doing them, um, I started actually with the child labor ones and did several of those and then moved through to the Japanese internment to Native Americans. Um, those were really large quilts because I wanted their portraits to be like three times larger than life almost. So they were like nine, 10 feet tall, but that's, you know, how I got involved. I just love the images and I, I have a minor in photography, so I just appreciate that. I used to have a dark room, used to print my own stuff. So, you know, that's part of the reason. Mm -hmm. And the, the different dyeing techniques that you use for different projects, you just, as you look at the photographs, do you decide what to do or? Well, I sort of, I think what I, I, what I tend to do is when I group the, I group photographs in Photoshop and sort of make a grid of what I'm thinking, how I think I want it to look. And then once I see that, I, I know like, for example, certainly with, with the, uh, the boys of the mines, I've done those images in grays and in blues and in hues that, you know, in, you kind of feel like that dusty, smoky sort of thing. With the Native Americans, I love doing those only because I can go so bright and so vibrant and use really strong reds and oranges and yellows that maybe wouldn't be appropriate for, you know, another type of quilt. Mm -hmm. So 
there are there it's pretty rare that if I get really stuck in the studio and I have no inspiration I do go to the buckets I just start dying and then somehow once I get myself moving because between projects for me is my hardest point so mm -hmm. once I can get myself moving again then something will come together great okay thank you um, and now I have a question for Judy Martin um, Judy thinking about your personal style that we saw in some of those photographs. What elements do you consider essential um, for you to make a 3D quilt? Or to make a work in 3D, I'm sorry. Um, I would say that my work is led by the materiality of cloth itself, the softness of cloth, the fact that it's like a human body and it, it wears out over time. The fact that it has a front and a back, usually, and that also makes it like a human person. I like how it has a feminine context because so much of it is about nurturing and caring for people. When you make a quilt or you uh, cover them with a blanket, it's, it's all about touching them and protecting them. I like all the metaphors and the baggage that goes along with textiles and with quilts and with blankets. And, and I use that when I, when I make my work. I use the language of the cloth that's already there. I use linen tablecloths because they speak about the ritual and the dreams and the conversations that go with the Sunday dinner and blankets that have touched live bodies when they're at their most vulnerable time. I, I, talk about the inner world and that is a vulnerable place and I think that they're so strong even though they're so soft. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's and also one more thing it's really I think about it in a very simple way. I, I like to have a simplicity to the work because I think that allows my viewer to come in with their own story better because there's more space for them. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, Did you hear me okay? Yes, we could. Um, so I'm going to ask each of you one more question. I think we'll work backwards then, if you don't mind. I'll ask you another question. Um, much of your work is large scale, um, and the, the size and weight of the project must uh, present its own challenges to you. So how do you overcome those challenges? Are you are you going to continue? That, that's, uh, yeah, that's a good question because uh, as I get older, I seem to want to work and uh, it's really difficult um, to haul these blankets like the piece that I'm working on now studio is made from two blankets and more blankets attached to it. So you can imagine carrying those up a 10 foot ladder and pinning them to a wall so they don't fall down. You have to kind of use the ladder as a support system. And there was a photo in my uh, show there that showed how the ladder was actually a, a third person or a second person for me. So the weight of them is difficult and um, I'd say there's a lot just to working with large textiles. Shipping them is difficult. Um, photographing them is difficult. If you just put it, you know, on your wall in, ha in the home, you have to find a place large enough and with good enough light. I have my work professionally photographed the fashion. It's difficult to get that done. But you know what? I really... I'd like to work with the large scale because I want people to feel like they're a little speck kind of, you know, when they're with my work and just realize how awesome, awesome it is to live and, and think about all your memories and your daydreams that come to you when you are in nature. I feel that the large scale uh, is like being outside looking over a hilltop or a hillside or over the horizon. So I want people to have that kind of feeling when they're with my work. And so it's sort of like nature in that it has the small marks that you see in the, um, the blowing grass or the blowing leaves or the rippling water, like these little marks, those are my stitches and the vast scale that they're all, they're in each the same, all unique, you know. 
I, did that answer the question okay? It, it does. I mean, clearly you're excited about it. So, um, well, thank you. Patty, can I go back to you? Uh, what excites you about creating um, art quilts and um, 3D textiles? And maybe what are you currently working on? Well, um, what I just recently finished was a quilt for an invitational um, that is going to be celebrating the women's right to vote 100 years. And so that was really fun and it's quite large, but um, it, I have, I think I have five or six different silk screens for that. And it features the suffragettes and with the banners and the flags and the individual faces of these women are, were so much fun to put together. And um, so I recently finished that. And fortunately I was able to get that printed before my print shop was closed down. And so right now um, I'm actually working on another um, accordion book because I'm using leftover silkscreen prints that I had um, in my studio, thinking of a way to keep myself busy without um, being down there to print something new. And, but I'm always excited about art quilts and, and I've always wanted to make books. So this was really a fun way for me to um, get into making books that are actually quilts in a way, because they are three layers and they are quilted and stitched. So that was really fun. And, but I've sewn my entire life. So for me, um, if I'm going to make artwork, I think to make it in fabric and in textiles is, it's just the, the way for me to work. I love the printing though. So mm -hmm. maybe I should have been a printmaker, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm a quilt maker right now. <laughs> you. Thank you. And, and Shannon, you've worked in 2D for, for years. Uh, what made you begin working in 3D? And is this where you see your work continuing? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like Patty and Betty. I've been sewing my whole life. My grandmother taught me when I was five. Fabric, I can't imagine my life not having fabric in it. Um, it's, um, it's um, yes and no. I think I will definitely continue in three-dimensional. I definitely want to play with my pomegranates more. I'll probably do two-dimensional as well. Um, it's, for me, kind of a fun place to go. I have a lot of fun playing with the fabric and the manip manipulating it. I, I have one small piece of old-fashioned really thick Tim Tex left and I want to use it sparingly because I can't find it that thick anymore. Um, so I think I probably will continue um, but I will commit continue to dimensional arts as well. I actually really have I really hope I'm done I'm retiring from teaching the end of this um, su summer and I'm looking forward to doing a whole series about the w female prophets so oh. whether it's two-dimensional or three-dimensional still up in the air okay so yeah I'll keep going oh, that's cool all right I, I have to throw in though my oldest son just graduated with his master's in biology and I've been informed I have to make a three-dimensional Drosophila gutifera fly Oh. from all his research work that he's decided I, I need to make him one that looks like built like the well. So Okay, we'll be anxious to see that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and then I have a question again for Betty. Um, maybe this is the hardest question of the whole day. Uh, how do you get started in the morning? What do you do to, do you have any rituals or activities that get you creative? And uh, how do you jumpstart your day? Well, there's a couple of websites that I look at every day after becoming enraged with the news and checking email and doing some eye rolling. But one of them is called Art Daily, and it calls itself the only art uh, newspaper on the web. And basically, it's art from all over the world, including, you know, ancient artifacts that they found and, you know, things that are happening basically all over the world. And I always look at that. And then I always look at a pod, which is astronomy picture of the day to remind me, and remind ourselves that we are but tiny little motes in the universe. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, thank you. 
Martha, do we have some we, questions we should, in the we audience? We sure do. Um, one of the things that I really enjoyed about this um, panel was that it turns out that Judy and Betty actually have a lot in common. They, they want to emphasize how we're just little moats and they both started the, this um, new direction for their work um, around their 60th birthday. Um, so that was fun. I mean, the artists in this group were chosen by Evelyn because their work really spoke to her. Um, we could have done 10 more of these to um, be able to meet all of the artists in the exhibition. And if you're interested, I hope that you'll go to sakwa.com and look at the information about the exhibition that's up on the website with artist statements from the other artists. All right, I'm gonna um, go through quickly in our remaining 10 minutes, um, some of the questions that came up. Apparently, um, our audience is only able to see what they type and so they couldn't necessarily see the questions and answers that were going through on the chat. Um, so somebody asked Betty if the plaster dome and sonotube tube remain inside the piece and the answer was yes. Betty said that she uses either button or carpet thread to, for its strength in gathering the quilt around that inner tube and that the tapering at the bottom is done by those gathering stitches. Um, what everybody wants to know, Betty, is what are you sewing on right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't be around Judy Martin without wanting to do hand stitching because she is my idol. Anyway, so this is actually, this is, this is kind of a, it's called Together and Apart, and it's part of a series of tessellating shapes that I've been making, but um, basically it starts off, it's kind of apropos to our situation now, so it starts off with these tessellating shapes right next to each other, and then it tapers off to where they get further and further apart. Wow. So I idiotically decided to hand quilt the background, so I'll be doing this until we can go out again. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Shannon, people wanted to know, number one, how did you choose the design for the picture? Is it based on some kind of ancient artifact? And you had mentioned that you were reading about the prophets and somebody wanted to know um, if there's a particular book that you would recommend. Uh, as far as the prophets know, um, the, the, the writings, um, the writings in the Torah, where I got them from, um, you, if you go online, you can find the list of the women that are there. A um, uh, few different sites. The Chabad, one of all places, actually has some good explanations. Um, but, uh, so that was that one. Um, I'm and sorry. The picture. Oh, the, ah, yes and no. Um, I had a clay pot sitting outside in the backyard that gave me a you know, water, old water pitcher that I thought that was a good start, but I did go online and look up ancient designs and kind of modified it on my own to, cause I was turning it into fabric. Um, so um, just the biggest thing was just trying to get the right balance, which took a few tries, <laughs> a lot of trial and error. Uh-huh. And, and what were the two books you mentioned that had directions for making things three-dimensional? Well, directions, um, Linda Johansson has some really fun books that give you directions. Um, so it gives you kind of the basis and you can go from there. But the book that kind of inspired me is by June Barnes and it wasn't directions, it was just more ideas. And when I saw this book, I've had it for a while. It was like, oh, I can do that. I, I got to yeah. try that. I can figure that out. It yeah, was kind of inspiring. Book. Yeah, it kind of pushed me to go outside my comfort zone and try something new. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they were fun. They were good starts. Yeah. People asked Patty about the fabrics that she's using. And she um, uses a nice quality cotton and then as well the feed sacks and somebody asked where does she get the feed sacks and Patty typed back that she's getting them on eBay but that they're getting more and more expensive and then um, somebody wanted to know was this it's doing the books the only 3D exploration that you've done Patty or are you now thinking about doing other ways to make things three-dimensional? Um, actually, the books um, are the only things I have done thus far. 
I've made, I think, six now. Um, and it's a way to utilize, like I said, when, when I silk screen for a quilt, I have to make a lot of extra backups in case there's a bad pull or a bad print or the colors don't work when I get back home. And so I always have quite a few extras. Sometimes I can make a small quilt, but I'm, I've always wanted to make a book. And I think that these are suitable because I can also add language to those pages. Um, it, I dye, all my fabric is just prepared for dyeing Kona cotton. It's a heavier weight um, fabric mm -hmm. because it takes, it holds the ink better for silk screen than it's, I'm not just dyeing, I'm also printing on top of it. Um, and then the, the book pages are Peltex <laughs> and it's the heavyweight, I think it's called 72 or something, but it's fusible on both sides, which is a little tricky because you have to line them up just right. And it, because when you hit the iron on the front, the back sticks too. So, you mm -hmm. know, it, the first time I did it, there were a few failures, but, um, but it's, it's fun to do. And, and it's, like I said, it's easy to manage um, compared to trying to manage like a seven or eight foot quilt. Mm -hmm. And then Judy, there's a question about your French knots. Were they going all the way through your fabric or um, were you working somehow with the inside and the outside separately? Oh. Yes, they do. They are instruction element in that piece. Um, that was a complicated thing because I, because it's two-sided, it has to look gorgeous on both sides. And the French knots on the reverse side, they're just um, a, a line going from one to the other. But I used that line to slow down the vertical strips on the other side. And then to hide that line, I stitched those the this so fabric together so that they stuck up and hid the construction line but they do match up the french knots are sewing down the, the lines on the back to answer mm -hmm. the question and then the questions that kept coming up were all right so you've created this wonderful piece of three-dimensional art how do you find a venue send it to the venue, deal with the weight, deal with the bulk, and then make sure that when you send it to the venue, that they're displaying it the way that it's intended. <laughs> um, so, I mean, Betty, I think yours is the biggest um, in some ways. So how do you ship it? I actually have crates made. Um, remember, I come from the ceramics world and we always made our own crates. And uh, this, working with fiber we have it so much easier in many many ways but it is very much more expensive and that is an ongoing it's an ongoing thing and it does limit what i do you know i i make things with a venue in mind uh, i have one a very large show coming up in santa fe and i can make whatever i want because i can drive it there and i can supervise the crew putting it up but as far as traveling shows it does it does limit you mm -hmm. yeah judy you you mentioned the weight and the bulk of working with these huge pieces so how do you ship it from place to place um we did build a crate for not to know but to go on and we and sakwa is using the crate that my husband built to to haul that around it is a heavy piece and it has to be folded exactly the right way so that it fits into the box that, that we made yeah um i don't know i think that is a challenge for textile artists who work 3d how do you know what it's going to be if you're not there to help install it um you just have to you just have to trust not to know go on <laughs> <laughs> there you go go ahead it really was a challenge so mine's not heavy but because the the bowl was the issue and thank you evelyn for putting it correctly because <laughs> its first venue was never correct mm -hmm. and i live nearby and when i went to see it i said can you fix it and they're like no <laughs> okay i sent you pictures so yeah it's it's a, it's a hope you know it's um because it got rolled up when it was supposed to roll kind of under. Um, yeah, it's a challenge. You, you, you give lots of notes and 
I had great deal of faith in the UPS store and they said, oh yeah, we can make you a box that's going to hold this. So I didn't have to worry about the weight, but I realized that I didn't have to worry about the final insta insta installation and putting all the pieces together. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot of hope that they know what they're doing. So yeah. Well, I want to thank you all so much. This has been really exciting. Even though I'm familiar with all of your work, I learn a lot by hearing you talk about it each time you say something completely different. So I learn more and um, it's a real treat. Evelyn, I wanna thank you so much for being brave and being our first guinea pig for these textile talks. Um, it's a real honor for Sakwa to have our art at the Regina Quick Center. And I know that you've hosted other Sakwa exhibitions in the past and hope to do so going forward. Um, we're hoping that all of the restrictions get lifted soon and people will have opportunities to see this exhibition in person because no matter how wonderful our virtual presentations are, nothing improves upon getting to it, be with the art in person. Please check out sakwa.com slash textile talks with an S at the end. That has the information about the next textile talk at the International Quilt Museum. And thank you all for joining us today. I think at the peak we had 472 people here, which is just wonderful. Thank you to our artists. Thank you, Evelyn. And we'll see you next week, Wednesday at 2. <laughs>